So hello everyone, welcome to today's event. My name is Laura Lamming, I'm a researcher here at the King's Fund. And today we're going to be talking about using a hybrid model to deliver care for long-term conditions. We've got an absolutely cracking panel for you today. Um, we're going to talk about the fact that digital solutions have already transformed how health services are offered, accessed and used, and will continue to do so in the years to come. With the adoption of new technologies, however, new ways of working are emerging that seek to combine the best of digital approaches with the benefits of face-to-face -face contact. So today our experts are going to talk to us about how wearables have created better health outcomes for people living with long-term conditions, particularly um, people with diabetes. They're going to look to the future and discuss how we can make sure that digital approaches are prioritised in the long term to continue empowering patients and supporting clinicians to create patient-centred care, leading to improved health outcomes. They're also going to explore the lessons from diabetes and wearables that offer wider learning across the NHS on harnessing the benefits of technology for a digital future. So before we get, um, kick off, I'd just like to thank our sponsor, that's Abbott. And I'd really just like to thank our speakers as well um, for taking the time to come and share their wisdom today. So as we're recording this ahead of time, we've put together a few discussion points. We'd really like to invite um, you guys in the audience to submit questions via Slido. You should be able to see a box next to the video that you're watching right now where you can submit your questions. And there'll be three of our speakers actually watching live along with you and they're going to focus on responding to the most popular questions that are submitted. Also, we'd just like to take this opportunity to encourage you to follow the conversation about this session on Twitter. So please use the hashtag, hashtag KF online, and be sure to um, uh, tweet about it to all of your friends and followers. So before we kick off, I'd just like to introduce our fab panel. Um, so if we could just go around, starting with you, Emma, and if you could just uh, introduce yourself and your role and um, which organisation you're from, please. Yes, thanks, Laura. So my name's Emma Wilmot and I'm a consultant diabetologist working in Derby in the UK. I'm also honorary associate professor at the University of Nottingham and I'm the founder of the Diabetes Technology Network UK. Fantastic. Thanks, Emma. Gloria, do you want to go next? Um, my name is Gloria Ogumbadejo. Um, I am a helpline advisor with Diabetes UK. Thank you, Gloria. Rakas, do you want to go next? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Laura. So, hi, I'm Wakas to here. I'm uh, a GP partner at Affinity Care. We are a large super partnership based in Bradford that provide healthcare services to almost 64,000 patients. Uh, I'm also a GP with an extended role and the clinical lead for um, what we have as a system act as one diabetes program, as well as the clinical lead for West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership. Um, as clinical re lead, um, I work closely with both CCG and integrated care system program managers. And one of our big, if you look at objectives or aims, is how we can improve the sort of lives and clinical outcomes uh, for people living uh, with diabetes, as well as um, supporting teams to sort of develop clear, I'm going to say, commissioning plans um, um, for the future. Thanks, Vakas. And last, but by no means least, Hannah, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Laura. So my name is Hannah Bieber. Um, I've not long taken up the post of consultant pharmacist at um, Leeds CCG. I'm an associate lecturer at Newcastle University and I'm the chair of the UK CPA um, Diabetes and Endocrine Committee. Thank you, Hannah. OK, um, we're going to start off with just some introductory questions. Emma, I'm going to come to you first. So what have been the key impacts on how secondary care services have been run since the pandemic began and how vital do you think digital technologies have been to you and your patients? Wow what a question to open with. Um, <laughs> I mean the bottom line is that we have been absolutely catapulted into this virtual world and um, as people watching will be aware people with diabetes have a heightened risk of adverse outcomes associated with COVID-19 so we very quickly had to change our services to ensure they were set up to protect people from diabetes from contracting COVID-19. So very quickly, we went from a face-to-face -face model where next to everybody was seen face-to-face -face in clinic 
to a virtual model, uh, model where everybody was, um, you know, telephone or online. And actually, um, where I work in Derby, we hadn't quite appreciated that we were ahead of the game in terms of what we were able to deliver. But we were one of the first CCGs in the country to get access to flash glucose monitoring. And as a result of that, we had quite high uptake. And we hadn't appreciated beforehand that we had all this data in the cloud, you know, it's just part of doing the clinic. But we very quickly realized when we started working in the virtual world that having that data there really facilitated us being able to have thorough discussions about glucose management and being able to support people with their diabetes effectively in the virtual world. And um, so massive, massive changes in diabetes, but also I think um, positives as well. I don't think we would have developed this model as quickly without the pandemic and virtual working is very much here to stay. And um, certainly a lot of my patients enjoy the fact that they no longer need to wait an hour and a half to get a space in the car park. They're not having to take half a day off work um, and, it, and it's more flexible. But equally, there are people that, that miss that face to face contact. And, you know, even beyond flash glucose monitoring, we're seeing other digital technologies such as insulin pumps that have data in the cloud. And we have continuous glucose monitoring for women that are pregnant that's um, been rolled out during the pandemic. Um, and that means that we have access to remote monitoring across a lot of areas in diabetes services. And um, so, I mean, overall, huge changes to services, huge changes to how we deliver care. Um, but I think we were, as a specialty, ahead of the game in terms of the level of provision that we could provide, given the uh, data in the cloud that we had going into the pandemic. Thank you, Emma. That's really interesting to hear. And it sounds like it's um, uh, been really empowering for your patients as well to, to have that access to that technology. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Gloria, on the, on the subject of, of patients. Um, so despite the advancements in technology over the past few years, many people living with diabetes are still not able to benefit quite yet. Um, I just wondered if you could share some of the key challenges that you and your colleagues are hearing on the Diabetes UK helpline. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Yes, uh, I think um, the main concern, um, as far as the, the callers are, um, are concerned, is about not the fear of not being able to have access to um, the healthcare professionals uh, as technology advances. You know, um, they're struggling as it is now, and there is a sense that, you know, um, it'll further, it'll make it even more difficult um, for them to have that face-to-face -face, um, um, connection with, with the healthcare professionals, which leaves a lot of people, you know, really fearful. Um, and some of the other things that people mention is um, sometimes there is a, a slight concern about being tethered, you know, to a um, <clears throat> piece of um, equipment and uh, being conscious about it um, somewhat. Um, and also um, sometimes when things go wrong with the technology, they, they don't have access to someone to help them with it. And sometimes they call the helpline to ask, you know, that, you know, they can't, either they don't know who to call or sometimes if they call the manufacturer, they don't get, you know, um, the support they need. Thank you for that, Gloria. And uh, yes, I guess that is um, sort of one of the challenges we've been experiencing with our with hybrid working generally, isn't it? Is that sometimes tech doesn't always do exactly uh, what it's supposed to work in exactly the right way. And, and you do need that support every now and then, don't you? <laughs> um, so just sort of moving towards the sort of primary care setting now, Wakas, I was just wondering how has COVID impacted your engagement with people living with and at risk of diabetes in, in a primary care setting? Yeah, I think it's probably similar to uh, some of the challenges that Emma's mentioned. So if we start with as a GP, the challenges that have been posed by uh, the COVID-19, they have had a significant impact uh, on, on our patients or my patients who are living with diabetes as well as those at risk of, of diabetes. So we know um, uh, we have evidence from a whole population study across the UK, which has shown us that you know people living with diabetes are independently associated with an increased risk of the serious complications and mortality with COVID-19. We also now understand and know that almost a third of all COVID-19 related deaths in the first wave were in people with diabetes. So again, you know, it's added a lot of morbidity and mortality burden um, um, and to this cohort. For me, many of my patients with diabetes they are from sort of minority ethnic backgrounds, they're overweight, uh, they belong to deprived communities. 
And all of these factors, they've sort of further exacerbated uh, the morbidity uh, as, as well as the, the sort of illness burden for these patients. If we look at primary care alongside this, we have had to make difficult decisions within the NHS to protect GP services, just to keep practices running, and also uh, to support patients in response to the pandemic. So for us, this has resulted in where routine diabetes services in sort of primary and community care has been severely disrupted. And like Emma mentioned, where care has taken place, much of it has moved um, um, towards uh, telephones or video. But also we have seen that this has been coupled with limited access to things like screening, as well as phlebotomy services. You're actually doing blood tests. And all this has, has resulted in sort of fewer patients having diabetes reviews, or, or, or I'm gonna say is effective diabetes reviews. And that has therefore led to sort of suboptimal management and, and that sort of lack of engagement that we would usually see. The lack of self-motivation, self-management by patients as well has suffered. I think it's fair to say that whilst primary care has embraced new technologies, and innovations, and, and, and the ways of working. We have struggled with clinical capacity and the management of sort of ongoing care needs for people uh, with any long term condition um, during this pandemic. So it has severely disrupted how we provide the care and also how we interact with our patients. Uh, it has severely been disrupted. Yes, of course. And I think that's something that's um, being felt across the system, isn't it? That, that sort of um, capacity issue. Um, I just wanted to sort of touch on, obviously you've um, been sort of taking on uh, the use of technology um, in primary care and that's perhaps a little bit unusual. Usually it's sort of specialist um, teams that do that. Uh, I just wonder sort of how that how that has been and whether or not you've sort of experienced any examples of sort of best practice around that that you'd like to share with us. Yeah, so I think um, for primary care, I think one of the biggest technologies was where we moved from, like Emma mentioned, uh, uh, I'm going to say it's predominantly face-to-face -face service to a remote way of working where we've um, shifted towards uh, both telephone triages as well as video um, consultations. So if we look at the start uh, of the pandemic, um, um, I think in the early months, almost three quarters of GP practices had moved to some form of telephone consultations. And if we look at data from last uh, May, May 2020, we know that almost 50% um, of consultations were happening through telephone or video. And that just shows that primary care have come on a long journey, just in terms of a, a, a normal cons consultation with the patient. And, and they have embraced the technology very well. I think specifically, if we look at how long-term conditions have been managed, uh, Emma's hinted at, we've sort of seen similar sort of um, waves of, of, of innovation across primary care. So we've had to adapt, we've had to be responsive to continue delivering care in, in this new world. And, and Emma hinted on uh, so flash glucose monitoring. So again, that's one of the things that um, in, in the community uh, diabetes services were really keen to, to, to sort of push and support. Um, and I'm sure as, as we go on, we'll probably have a longer discussion around some of the challenges that we face, but also um, 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 some of the sort of um, key areas where we, we might want to, um, or where we think are, are good areas of, of improvement that we can see across our system. And we see a similar sort of, um, just below what Emma said, we see a similar sort of um, thing happening, not, not just in diabetes, but also in the, in the way we manage other long-term conditions. So for instance, hypertension, a lot of it we've moved towards remote monitoring and remote home blood pressure monitoring systems. And we also see a similar sort of um, start in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or respiratory illnesses where you know, patients uh, have SATs monitors at home. So we are seeing, um, I'm going to say, small steps in, in, in innovation that are being adopted across um, primary care. No, just to, to add into that as well, another key thing uh, which has become really a paramount importance, certainly in the area where I work in Derby, is IT integration between primary and secondary care. Uh, so we're lucky enough in Derby to have um, an integrated diabetes service where we all work on the same IT system, System 1. And it means that when somebody in primary care needs advice or wants to refer somebody in, when they do, we in secondary care have got access to the full record on System 1. And it means that the, the conversations that are had and the advice that can be given you know, it's on a different level compared to just sort of paper referral with min minimal information. And it means that I can very quickly send a task back to the GP and almost have a conversation about the next steps. And I think that sort of seamless care with that digital integration between both really helps um, prevent further delays in how people are seen and managed. And that, again, has come into its own during the pandemic. 
Hannah, I'm going to come to you next, if that's okay. Uh, so with all the sort of upcoming changes, both sort of more broadly in health and care, such as, as we've discussed, the move towards integrated care systems, and within diabetes, included, including various changes in the guidance, I just wondered if you'd talk around some of the potential impacts on the service that the NHS will be able to provide for people living with diabetes and how can we overcome them? Yes, I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited about the ICS coming and how people are structuring into that, the primary care networks um, beneath that. And I think that it really does provide an opportunity. Like Emma says, she's obviously providing some integrated care services. And I think that, you know, that was in the long term plan. And I think that is what we're all trying to move towards. The primary care networks are really, um, really that chance to get that embedded in those contact points um, as you build up those primary care networks and within that the diabetes specialist teams or dias teams um, those are perfect solutions to be able to get, get those technology get that technology up and running to make sure that um, people are trained to be able to start the technology because i think sometimes that can be a barrier that people are scared they don't really know what they're doing and um, that needs to happen that training within primary care um, because we are we have underserved populations and i think that you know a good example of that at the moment is the learning difficulty people people living with learning difficulties because people aren't comfortable with starting the technology at the moment and actually a good proportion of people who might be eligible for that technology or the the flash glucose at the moment aren't actually getting access to that because people don't feel comfortable starting the technology so there's a big training piece to be done and actually those primary care networks and starting to build some more specialism within them and then those links like Emma's talking about into the integrated team so that information is flowing the technology speaks to each other um, is so so important there's even just it governance and um, we try to do a small project um, at, my, at my last trust which was around using flash glucose and even just getting the getting the libre view onto laptops so that we could see the data was was quite challenging and i think so it's all about that building up um building up those systems where we can see across 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 boundaries but also just that we can get we can get the technology um so that we're using it to the best advantage i suppose which which can be can be challenging um i think there's also some barriers there around um socioeconomic deprivation and being able to reach some of those communities with the technology um where they might not be like like emma also mentioned that about people not wanting to come in for an appointment i think that's not unique to secondary care i think also primary care we have people who who don't want to come in um, um, to see somebody but that you might be able to reach them via a virtual uh, a virtual route um, and I think Wakas touched on that as well um, and I think also trying to reach um, reach people um, across and you know making sure that there aren't any aren't any differences because of ethnicity as well we have a massive ethnically diverse population similar to Wakas as well um, and we need to make sure that everybody has access to this technology and we're not um that we're that we are being consistent with the way that we deliver deliver our services so the ics and the commissioning as well of some of this technology needs to think sensibly about how we how we embed how we embed technology and how it becomes a lot more routine and that is something that's usable as well because we don't have a million a million hours in the day to spend to this this needs to be something that enables enables clinicians to work better um, with people living with diabetes to get them the best outcomes in the long term absolutely thank you hannah yes and then um, obviously after sort of covid and and uh, the sort of highlighting of health inequalities again you know this is a great bit of tech to really help bridge those gaps again isn't it um, Gloria, I could see you nodding along to Hannah during that. I just wondered if there was anything you'd like to come in and, and talk about, given what you've heard on the helpline. Yes, well, it, it, it's, it's about um, who gets the technology sometimes. Um, we've had callers who said, um, like with type 2, that um, some some people say that they know people who, um, who use insulin and... Um, get technology and they can't so something about postcode lottery again you know um and i'm not sure how um 
how that actually works. But, you know, <clears throat> I've had a few callers um, saying, you know, just feeling that, you know, maybe they're being um, discriminated against for one reason or another. So I'm not quite sure how the technology is um, distributed, you know, and uh, how how evenly um, and everybody getting the opportunity to to get it if they fit the, cri the criteria, but some people getting and other people not getting. That that that's something that um, is of concern too. At the moment, I think a lot a lot of places have set set up the the Libre so that you can. The, the initial prescription has to be written by secondary care and I think that's a that's been a huge barrier it, obviously there's a cost implication with primary care taking that back um but also it's it's really is becoming a big barrier um to people being able to access so I think that's that's definitely something that needs to get looked at once the ICS is a, a fully functioning well Cass I'm going to come to you again now if that's okay um so as with all innovation, there is obviously a risk that new digital technologies can adversely impact those with the worst health outcomes, as we've sort of been alluding to already, I think, in the discussion, um, and actually widen those health inequalities rather than close them. So what do you think are the key steps that need to be taken to ensure the best health and care is actually available to everyone? Anything you want to sort of build on from what's been said already? Yeah, uh, thank you, Laura. I, I do, actually. I think I just want to... Um build on what Gloria and Emma have mentioned. So for, for a moment, I just want to really take us back to that conversation, because in essence, what they were highlighting there was something that was suggested almost half a century ago by Julian Hart in terms of the inverse care. And that's what indirectly we were talking about. And so what is it that was mentioned back there? And, and it was this sort of perverse relationship that we see between sort of the need uh, for healthcare and its actual utilisation. So in other words, you know, those who need the, the, the medical care are least likely to receive it. And conversely, we, we can look at it on the other side, is that those with the least need of healthcare tend to use these health services or digital technologies more and more effectively. And it is interesting because I do see sort of a similar sort of effect on my patch in our place as well, in terms of access to these new digital technologies across our populations. And for us across Bradford and Craven, um, we initially just looked at um, flash uh, glucose monitoring data and we found as a CCG when I was comparing West Yorkshire data that we weren't probably too bad. We were just above the national average or at par with the national average. So on the surface, it looked like access wasn't a problem and, you know, the utilisation wasn't a problem. I just then started to think about a few questions. Actually, who are these people who are utilising it? What do the outcomes look like? Are they benefiting? If not, what is it that we need to look at? What is it that we need to unpick? And I think that's what really brought to attention for me this sort of um, socioeconomic health divide this, uh, that we see, because what we identified with the data over the last 12 months was sadly this sort of dichotomy of care that I see, in which case those um, patients belonging to those uh, areas or practices that were most deprived, that again were belonging to uh, a higher ethnic minorities, they had um, well, well below national average, between five and 10% utilization or access to the technologies. And this is within a small geographical area of one city we're talking about. And on the other hand, we also saw that those that were belonging to higher socioeconomic backgrounds or patients uh, living with diabetes from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, their access and utilization of the technologies was in the high 60s to 70%. And again, I couldn't really understand when we have one policy, we're all following the same process. We all have similar access, we think. Why do we see this variance of care? You know, there must be something underlying it. So we've actually started to unpick that and start a scoping exercise, trying to unpick what are these causes. And some of the things which um, we've sort of found or, or steps which we've noted that could improve um, um, access, utilisation, as I would say is how do we um, ensure that the coverage of universal healthcare is available across our population. And, and I think it's an important concept for us. For me, the few things that I've um, highlighted or that I've seen that would be useful, Emma actually picked on one of the key things there, which is probably one of my first points. And that is that we, we really do need to have a renewed focus on our workforce and our infrastructure. Emma mentioned, you know, it's taken three, four years where it started in secondary care. You've got a very strong secondary care workforce that are well equipped with understanding the technology. And actually, as we start to roll this out to other populations, i.e. patients with type 2 diabetes, on insulin, perhaps with complications, 
we need to have the backbone workforce there in primary care and in the community services to support this ongoing work. Otherwise, it's just going to be a drain on secondary care services and we'll be back to square one. So I think for us, we really need to look at how we improve recruitment, how we improve um, retention to address the shortages in both the short and the longer term. And now the pandemic has shown us that we have a dedicated and resilient workforce. And for me, I think it's important to recognise that we really, need to, we really do need to think about having a culturally diverse and inclusive team. Often in my clinics, what I found myself is that I often have more constructive, effective and more successful interactions with patients um, from a similar ethnic and cultural background. And that might well be because we relate better to them as well. Secondly, I think which has been the purpose, um, I'm going to say, is or, or one of the hot topics for our discussions has been around health inequalities and, and, and the concept of probably, I'm going to say, population health. And again, you know, COVID-19, it has exposed the sort of deep health inequalities that exist across England. Um, Emma's mentioned some of you know, th th those uh, figures and statistics. And again, you know, Gloria's mentioned the feedback that we're getting from patients um, from different areas. You no, know, is there still a postcode lottery? That's one of the questions we're still asking ourselves. And I think here we do need to be a bit more ambitious in our approach around how we improve population health and how we reduce these health inequalities. For me, this actually leads back to what Hannah mentioned around the ICS footprint, around actually thinking about our commissioning. We do need to invest more in prevention. And I think that's probably going to be one of those areas where we can sort of start seeing um, early rewards around both outcomes and also around reducing inequities or inequalities in access um, to care and digital technologies. For me, I think we really need to have more understanding around the extent and nature of digital exclusion, particularly um, in an area where, where, where I practice, where the literacy levels are very low as well. And again, that probably has to be, uh, for policymakers, it really has to be central to the decisions we make about care delivery, how we design our care delivery, how we implement this. Um, like I said earlier, we're in the process of undertaking this scoping exercise to understand what I'm going to describe as the why and the what questions around the uptake, in particular of flash glucose um, monitoring. And last but not least, and this might be very similar, I might resonate with, 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 with colleagues um, um, in, in the audience there as well. I, I really do feel we need to strengthen the relationship and really have a different way of thinking about our communities and our health services. We really need to have this sort of community partnership feel. We need to change how health and care services work with people in communities. It's a different way of working, but it actually recognises the role that people play in improving their own health and, and, and we have a role in supporting them to do so. And that's actually our, resist our resilience within the system. And we need to take marginalised communities, excluded people along us on that journey. Uh, and, you know, just to share, um, um, we've done something very similar locally um, across our patch where I was involved in a, a diabetes engagement event purely focused around a Bangladeshi community. And this was a really good opportunity for us to sort of reflect on our shared learning that was involving healthcare professionals and more importantly, the lived experiences of the citizens, you know, people living with the condition. They were telling us what they wanted rather than me thinking this is what they need to improve their care. And it's a very different uh, um, way of, 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 or an approach to addressing a problem. And I was really, really, and I have to say, I was really inspired, really energized because, of, and, and overwhelmed, I must say, that they offered to really, you know, work with us. And they said, right, okay, we will help you um, develop, you know, culturally appropriate materials or leaflets, not just in the language, but in a context that we understand that makes sense to us. Beyond that, you know, they went way out of there. They said, right, if there is a health message that you want to get into the heart of your community, we are more than happy to act as volunteers or conduits or engagement pillars to actually get the message to the people you want the message to, 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 to be sent to. And I think it's that sort of feel that we need that can sort of um, reduce the, uh, this widening gap in health inequalities. But also more importantly, I think it's just the backbone to the NHS and how we deliver the healthcare for the future, really. So it's a long-winded answer, but <laughs> there's a lot of things I needed to say there. I just wondered if anybody else um, wanted to sort of come in on, on that and sort of ways that we should be prioritising um, the unwell patients. And any thoughts from the panel? Well, Emma, go for it. Yeah, I mean, my only thought was, you know, we were talking about diabetes management. Um, ultimately, self-management is what we're aiming for. We want somebody to feel confident and empowered to successfully manage their diabetes. 
And as clinicians, it's our job to give them the tools to do that, whether it's education or technology. Um, but like Wakaz says, my huge concern is the digital divide. You know, I was mentioned at the beginning, the value of having data in the cloud and effective consultations. But actually, if you've not got a smartphone or you've not got internet access at home, you don't have data in the cloud. And I think that one of the challenges going forward for, with the NHS, both for primary care and secondary care, is building in the flexibility and scope in terms of, you know, oh, this is somebody that needs to face a face-to-face -face and we can offer that at short notice versus here's a telephone appointment. And I think the NHS probably hasn't quite got the flexibility in how it books people into the system, particularly in secondary care, um, to do that. But moving forward, I think we need to be able to offer more choice because, you know, I can sit here and talk about how great it is to have virtual consultations, but the reality is not everybody wants that. Um, but when you've got appointments booked months and months in advance, being able to offer choice isn't always there. And I think that's something we need to all look at. Um, Hannah and Gloria, anything that you wanted to add on that? Absolutely. Sorry, I was going to say that um, I think that's right. I think we need to use the technology to the best of our ability to be able to get the resource where it needs to be. I think there's something to be said about um, being able to escalate appropriately so people being able to get more frequent access when they need it. But likewise, sometimes we're so rigid, aren't we, bringing people back for an app for an annual review? And actually, sometimes they don't. They're perfectly fine. They might not need that annual review. They might need their care processes checked. Absolutely. Um, but actually, sometimes we bring people in when they actually don't need care as well. So there needs to be flexibility both ways. I'd be interested to see what what the rest of the panel think about that. But I think sometimes um, we need to flex it both ways. Yeah, and if I can just sort of pick up on that point, um, and again, something that we did during the pandemic, which was particularly useful. So we've got a, you know, we've got over one thousand six hundred people using Libre in my service, um, and when you've got the data in the cloud, the platform there allows you to rank people based on the either the amount of hypoglycemia they've got or the estimated HbA one C. So when we were going through periods in the pandemic where we had very limited staffing. It means that I could go in there, rank people, identify those at highest risk of admission with hypoglycemia, go in and just double check that they'd had the contact they needed and if not, put that in place. Uh, and again, I think that was so powerful. You know, never before have I had a way of measuring hypoglycemia risk like that. Um, and that was, that's a great way. And again, NHS services aren't really set up to deliver care in a way that meets needs in that way. And again, we need to work together to really think about how we reshape, reshape services to make the most of the data that we've got available. But again, coming back to the point we made before, that's all well and good, but I've only got uh, data in the cloud for the people with the smartphones and the internet, and actually the people with the highest risk might not be in there. So, yeah. Thank you, Emma. Um, I'm just gonna sort of continue with you if that's all right. Um, I was just wondering how you think the widespread adoption of digital services to support those living with diabetes can actually help the overburdened NHS workforce to deliver the level of care that they'd like to. And I think you've sort of started to touch on that already just in that last answer, but I just wondered if you had anything you wanted to add around that. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if people can self-manage, then they need to see us less, and that's ultimately what it's about. And certainly locally, we've audited the outcomes of Freestyle Libre users. And if we looked at people that went on Libre with an HbA1c above 86, so very high, we were seeing a drop of 18 millimoles per mole which is absolutely huge. Um, so if we can get this technology into the right hands, support them to make the most of it, they are going to need our services less and that's going to take the pressure off. I'm thinking about other digital technologies coming through. You may have heard Simon Stevens announce about the NHS England pilot of closed loop. So there's a thousand patients with type one diabetes in the NHS that have got access to closed loop technology where the insulin's automated. And again, some of the patients in my service in that pilot that had the highest HbA1c levels are now at a, a really great level of glucose control and they will need to see us less. So it's about prioritising those that really need the te technology to get them into a better place and then ultimately relieving the stresses from the NHS because these individuals will need less intensive support over time. Thanks, Emma. Um, I could see uh, you nodding along, Wackass. I wondered if you wanted to uh, chip in on that. Yeah, no, yeah. I was just saying uh, on both of Emma's answers, I think in, within the NHS, we are becoming more smart. And what Emma's described there is like a risk stratification from her patients on, on, on freestyle labour. 
and we're seeing a lot uh, of, of adoption of different tools to, to support both primary care, secondary care, patients with different conditions to sort of risk stratify them according to either uh, a risk of deterioration or, or a certain priority that we set for that patient. And I think this is just, uh, we're on this journey and I think we will slowly evolve towards this because I, for me, you know, um, what Emma described was really, really smart way of looking and um, utilizing your time as effectively as you can to provide population health. And I think the next step of that would probably be how we can then set triggers within a system to automate this. And a bit of artificial intelligence would be really good there. And I think second to that, I would add is what would be really good, and, and Hannah hinted on it, is that sometimes we'll often um, see a patient today and the next clinic appointment that's available is four or six months later. And that'll just be happening years and years within it. This is how we normally do it. And actually, we might bring them into clinic and everything's okay. And we didn't probably really need to see them. But there was a patient we saw last week that we really needed to bring today, but we can't because there's no appointments. And I think that smart way of utilizing the data or moving appointments around and being flexible is probably one of the key things that we need to think about how we set up our clinics, how we set up our services. And I think second to that is, I think probably the app developers will develop something is how we can have sort of patient activated responses. So for instance, um, you know, a, a personal example was um, a few years ago um, uh, when my wife, um, she got gestation diabetes, uh, so we're from the Northeast. So she was having care both in Newcastle with the um, maternity teams there and the diabetes teams there. And then obviously uh, we had the local teams as well where I knew the diabetologist locally as well as the nutrition. So sometimes she would have a review here, sometimes she would have a review there. But what was really interesting was that I went with her to the local reviews and we would wait two, three hours, like Emma mentioned. So, yep, car park's running. Um, I need to go to the clinic. And I'm like, right, well, we're going to miss another session. And just waiting and then, you know, saw the consultant. Yep, how are you doing? Everything's fine. Everything looks good. Um, you don't really need to scan. We don't need to do any blood tests. Your readings are fine. Well done. And off you go. And for that five minute chat, we have to come in for three hours, childcare, other things, you know, whatnot, you know, and, and, and this is why I was seeing it through the eyes of a patient in terms of, of how, how does that feel to us? And is that really a good utilization of my time, of the clinician's time, of the hospital services? No, it isn't. On the other hand, to contrast with that, she was also then having remote reviews with the, the, the maternity and endocrine team at Newcastle. And it was really, really interesting because they were just doing remote um, text messages. We were putting a blood glucose level. They were using a system called Flory. And we would just get um, you know, a message back. Yep, yeah, you need to send your next reading. And it's been two hours since you've had a food. Yep, do this. And I think it's just clever and smart thinking that all of that data was going back to them. And it wasn't that then uh, it was more work for the healthcare professional because they had automated systems. So as long as it's within range, like I mentioned, you're green. Fine, we don't need to worry about your things are working nicely. And just to sort of pick up on that as well, because um, one of the projects I was involved during the pandemic was working with a, a group of diabetologists um, to try and come up with a red, amber light traffic light system where we could really identify those in red were the people that really need to get seen urgently and so that across primary and secondary care we could all sort of deliver care as needed. Um, and I think that needs to stay, we, but we need to read, read set up our services so that we can get rapid access but also you need the ability for the patient just to contact and say I'm struggling I need to come in now which we don't really have um, but I think we're so used to this annual review annual review or we'll see a bit more often or book you in three months but it's, it's what we're we're stuck in the mud aren't we we need to somehow get out of there and start changing how we do things. Thank you, Emma. Um, Gloria, I was just wondering if, if you'd heard sort of anything on the helpline around this this sort of idea of working differently and, and you know, coming to appointments and waiting and, and you know, it's, it's actually brief compared to doing it, high, you know, online. I just wondered if you'd heard anything. Well, um, mostly, you know, where the, where the callers are right now is there's just a lot of confusion. They don't, and maybe obviously with the pandemic that that has created this um this this panic um, as to patients feeling that they're just being left behind. They don't know, you know, who they see different people, you know, different doctors. It, there's just no continuity. Um, so there's there's just a lot of fear, you know, with with the callers right now um, as to not being able to manage their diabetes effectively. And um, ending up calling the helpline, 
really for consultations with the, as if they're talking to the GP, you know, because they feel um, that's pretty much the only place that they can actually have conversations with um, <clears throat> with anyone for any length of time, you know. So that that that's um, that's a bit worrying, you know, because obviously we, you know we're not um, that's not our remit to give um, <clears throat> medical um, information, but you know the the callers, you know really just feel really panicked at the moment, you know, um, and just wondering where things are really going to go, you know, um, and it, it, feeling as if, and a lot of the callers have two or three different um, uh, health challenges in addition to diabetes, which compounds the problem, you know, um, and, and it, it just feels as if the calls are getting more and more despairing, <clears throat> which of course is, is of concern. You know, we're, we're glad that they feel they can call the helpline, um, but it's also trying to give them some kind of um, uh, hope <laughs> as to the fact that um, things will get better or there'll be a different way of working um, that, that will take um, into consideration, you know, the, the fears and the concerns they have. Having said that, you know, overall, um, <clears throat> The, the technology is very empowering for the people who who use them. I mean, it's given them a uh, lease in life and independence, you know. So that's, you know, there's no, it's not taking away that, um, but it's not reaching enough people, you know, um, to be able to access it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gloria. I just wanted to come to you, Hannah, now. Um, and I think, you know, Gloria sort of started talking about people with sort of multiple conditions and i just wondered you know what does the future look like for diabetes care in a hybrid model of virtual and face-to-face -face care enabled by technology such as wearables and what do you think are some of the key lessons to learn from diabetes care that could be applied to other long-term conditions now yeah, so a great question. So I think overall, and just listening to what everybody's saying, um, I think this is all about connectivity, isn't it? Connect connectivity to um, to the people living with diabetes from professionals, but actually probably connectivity to one to one another. Probably some peer support there, and some um, <clears throat> some connectivity to other people living with diabetes. I think, uh, like Gloria said, I think that you know there is some burden um, from managing comorbidity at this level and you know the people that certainly are seen in secondary care often living with you know three plus comorbidities at a minimum um, and likewise out in out in secondary care there's there is a huge burden of disease also so I think that there's something to be said about that connectivity offering some comfort and actually if we do manage to ha harness being having having that oversight like Emma's described that that being able to review or monitor from afar um, and to keep people safe and I think safety is a massive a massive benefit here that actually that could be really comforting for people to know that there is that oversight from professionals um, and also potentially from from peer support if we manage to enable that in the much further afield this is blue sky thinking now Laura I think um, so. I think that responsive service, knowing that somebody is going to step in if something looks like it's heading in the wrong direction and that actually for people who might not be able to see that coming for themselves, um, that actually you do have that backup system um, or that, that fallback. And, and that might be really beneficial for people who, for example, are living on their own, um, people who don't have massive support systems outside of actually the professionals that care for them. I think there's something to be said about motivation and helping people motivate around self-care. Emma's touched on that a lot already. And we know that actually that frequent monitoring is in, increases and drives up adherence to um, a variety of things from my point of view. I'm a pharmacist, so um, the medications, for example, or um, or likewise lifestyle and, and lifestyle measures, etc. It would be really nice to see this come to a point in the in the not too distant future where we can use it in groups for peer support um, and that we can try and share results um, and that we can try and uh, there's been a lot of success around sort of 
I hate to use the word, but gamification, probably not. Um, it feels a little bit, still feels a bit uncomfortable, that term, if I'm being honest, but but something to sort of drive forward, to share share experience, to try and um, to try and harness that side of the use of, uh, of, of flash glucose, but also other 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 wearables as well. Um, Wakas touched on on just being able to get some of that information back. I get emailed now with blood pressure monitoring that people have been recording on apps on their phone, and it's so helpful, <laughs> so much more helpful than one point of data that we used to have. Um, and and so I think we considered glucose, yes, but also it's all these other parameters that people can take into their own self management spheres, um, which haven't been haven't been there previously. And I think other long term condition management, how do they learn from what we've learned with diabetes? And I think that is that self care is the way forward and that actually it doesn't mean that as professionals we step out of it um, completely, but that we are being more responsive and flexible. And I think that all, all long term condition management needs to go that way because we haven't got the resource in honesty, like there is not enough resource for, for managing all these long term conditions. Thank you so much, Hannah. And yes, I just want to echo what you said about self monitoring as well. Coming from a health psychology background, that's that self monitoring is one of the, the big hitters in terms of having a really strong evidence base for behavior change in so many different areas, as you say, which is why I think, you know, its use in diabetes monitoring is so interesting. And as you say, seeing that trend is such a, is such a motivational um, thing for an individual, I think. Um, Emma, Wakas, Gloria, anybody want to come in? Emma, I can see you've, you've come online, go for it. Yeah, no, I just wanted to pick up on the point about peer support. Um, I cannot stress how important that is. Um, one of the things I did when I joined as a consultant in Derby is I found a few keen individuals and they set up a Derby Type 1 Facebook page and we've now got over 600 members on there. Um, and actually the feedback has been amazing. You know, I've had people that have got um, depression, anxiety, who say they're having a difficult night and they're up at two in the morning. There's somebody else there that they can communicate with on the Facebook page that understand what it's like to live with diabetes and the stresses that come with it. I've had people with ketones that have had support from the diabetes community to help them with the sick day rules to prevent admission. And then my, my favourite story, I'll just quickly tell you this one, uh, Derby were playing at the uh, playoffs down in Wembley and there's a chap who's recently diagnosed diabetes who got to the playoffs and then got there and realised he'd run out of insulin. So he phoned 111 and they said, you need to go to the hospital to get some insulin, you know. So and he thought, oh, that's, I'm missing the game, the day's a disaster. And then he thought, wait a minute, I've got the Facebook page. We went on, is anybody at Wembley? And of course, it's Derby are playing. So and sure enough, five minutes later, somebody appears next to him with a spare insulin pen and that saved him a trip to the hospital. So peer support, definitely. It's really easy. It's free. You know, it's something we can we can all do in our local areas. Uh, and I'm a huge advocate of it. Thanks, Emma. And done digitally as well. <laughs> Even better. Um, Gloria, I'm going to come to you now, if that's all right. So based on the conversations you've had with people living with diabetes, in addition to you know, everything that we've discussed today, um, what do you think are some of the most important considerations to take into account of how they would like to experience their care in the future based on their experiences to date and their expectations, I guess, around what really is possible now, especially within mm -hmm. this sort of hybrid and digital sphere? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit of a minefield because um, <clears throat> a lot of the responses are, um, from the callers are about how they're spoken to and um, which is of concern, you know, obviously when people call in, you know, um, the perception and, and you take all of those things into consideration and, and but the similar things that are being said in terms of you know, be, being um, the finger wagging is still going on. You know, the accusations, the you know judgments, and and for a lot of callers who are really struggling, who a lot of them say that they're trying to do the best they can, and uh, and actually are are doing everything that they've been told to do, but for one reason or another, um, their their diabetes is just not under control for a variety of reasons. But there is real concern as to the conversations and how they're being, um, you know, how, how they're being supported, you know, um, emotionally and psychologically, you know, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's a really difficult thing because of the, 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 
the, the, the time that we're in now, everybody's under stress. The caregivers, the you know, everybody's you know um, under some level of stress. But the callers you just feel that they 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 want to be listened to a bit more. They want to to feel um, <clears throat> like people they take into consideration the struggles that they they're going through in trying to maintain you know um, a, a healthy a healthy lifestyle. And, and I guess also well, listening to Akas, I was thinking, wow, um, the callers that we're getting generally are saying they don't get to see anybody for a year. You know, no, nobody checks on them. They don't have appointments. That, you know, so I was listening to you and I was thinking that would uh, our callers would love to say that they have too many appointments. You know, but right now it's about you know some of them just feel that they're. they're you know, nobody, nobody's checking on them. You know, how can anybody know um, how they're getting on with their diabetes or or if it's being managed? And a lot of callers just feel they don't know what to do. They don't, you know, they don't have any guidance. They don't, you know, so it, it, it's, it's interesting what, where where the gaps are. And, 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 and obviously, the, again, taking into consideration this pandemic, it's sort of turned everything upside down. You know, some of these things were being, you know, we we're hearing some of these concerns before the pandemic, but, you know, it's really just escalated. It's, you know, right now. And, and just thinking how, how are we, how can we now begin to adjust everything, you know, so that the callers get what they need, you know, because many of, many, many of the callers are really struggling and doing everything they can. Um, like a call I got yesterday, somebody saying, you know, he's, he's eating healthily, he's doing exercise, but his blood sugars just keep going up. And all he's being told is that he's not doing, you know, he's not, he's not doing the right thing, you know, and, and for many, many of the callers, it, it's just, they just feel hopeless. So um, it's over to you. <laughs> In terms of, you know, how, how, how can we, how can we help you to help us, you know, as they say, you know, to help our callers, you know. Thank you, Gloria. Um, I was going to throw it open to the clinicians in the room about how they think maybe the, the sort of um, hybrid working digital sphere can kind of help with that, that feeling that patients are feeling sort of maybe not listened to, maybe not seen quite as often as they, they want. And Emma, you were sort of touching on on this earlier. Do you want to come in here? Yeah, so I'm just really, really saddened to hear that Gloria's getting this feedback. Um, you know, fundamentally, you've, we've got all these treatments for diabetes, but central to a good diabetes consultation is good communication. And there's been a recent big movement by NHS England on language matters, and it's about, you know, being empathetic, really hearing the individual, getting their perspective, and moving away from this judgmental approach. And I'm really sad to hear that that's still going on. And, you know, thinking about digital technology as well. Um, in the past, people sometimes came to clinic and didn't bring their blood glucose readings. And that's because they were ashamed of the higher readings. But that's one thing we need to be very careful with, with this new technology, because the data's in the cloud. We can see everything and people might be scared about sharing the data. And it's particularly if they have experiences where they come in and the clinician says, for goodness sake, what have you done there? They're not going to want to share their data again. So now more than ever, we need to be very careful about how we communicate and we need to be really supportive. And one thing that I tend to do when I look at glucose data with people is say to them, identify three things that are going really well. And they sort of look at me as if what? Because they come armed with a list of things that they must do better. But actually we need to just give people a break. You know, it's been a really stressful 18 months for all of us. We've been through a difficult time and we need to do what we can to support people to get to a better place, not beat them up um, with the data that we've got. So I think, you know, a real word of, of caution on that. Um, so, yeah, Gloria, I'm just um, really disheartened to hear. And I think we've all got work to do um, to try and address that. Thank you, Emma. And yes, it, it sounds like it's, it's reframing their approach to self-management. You know, people are working hard to try and to try and do things but it's it's often harder to see the the good things that you're doing than it is to see the things that need improvement isn't it um so we're coming to the end of time now so i was just wondering if um i could ask everyone to uh to just provide their closing remarks um so hannah can i come to you first please absolutely i think for me the probably the resounding 
final thought really was about about building back better and actually really embracing this technology um, to actually address some of the challenges. Yes, there's some financial challenges and we'll overcome those as a system, but but actually, actually what this technology can give us and help us with and help most importantly the people living with diabetes is far and above far away um, much better than anything that we need that we'll struggle with financially so we need to really build back better embrace the technology as we go forward thanks hannah that was great um gloria your your final thoughts on the topic today well, I think um, just listening to what everybody has said on the panel, um, interestingly, my final thought is, or words, is that thank you all very much for the incredible work you do um, to support um, our callers. And I think for me, that's that's where, that's what I feel at this, this present time, just to thank you all for the amazing work you do. And of course, you know, like um, Emma said, it's, it's about communication, you know amongst all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. And I'm sure um, everyone here won't mind if I say, you know, and thank you to you as well, because you're obviously doing an invaluable job being that sort of point of contact as well. Um, Wackass, can I come to you next? Yeah, um, thank you, Laura. Um, and yeah, thank you as well, Gloria. Um, I think um, we're on a journey where we're digitalizing uh, diabetes care, digitalizing clinical pathways. And I think for me, one of the key things um, for um, clinicians, for policyholders, for commissioners, is actually to always think about that question. It is going to help patients, it is going to help populations, but we shouldn't inadvertently create a health divide or create um, or widen that gap of health inequalities. So that would be my first thing. And the second thing is, I think we really do need to have a very different way of approaching um, um, consultations and approaching um, um, diabetes care or any chronic disease care with our patients. And I think I really do like the concept of the community partnerships because actually within the NHS, within the restraints, the financial restraints, the, 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 the workforce that we don't have, and we have an, uh, a population that is growing, that is aging, that will be getting more comorbidities. We know all these illnesses are on the rise. So the, 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 the question is, you know, how how can we sort of safe proof the current delivery for the future and for me one of those things is actually getting the getting communities and getting patients involved in improving their self-management and, and and the third probably thing which i'm probably stealing emerson is is absolutely she, she hit it on the nail language matters and um i really do like uh, emma's approach because that's something i i tried to um, um emulate as well which is emma's absolutely right patients often come and they look at you and they see an MDT team and the first thing they're thinking of is, oh my God, they're going to point out that high, they're going to point out what I did there, they're going to find all this and my numbers have gone up, my weight's gone up and that's going to be the conversation. And it is about how we, um, so I had to actually um, just improve consultations, I actually did some motivational interviewing and I find you know, things like that are really, really useful as tools. And I like them still because that's what I often work on because I think for a patient, how do we get them on board? I often say, look, you've done really well, really well here. Oh, this is a bit up. Do you remember what happened here? And often they'll tell you, oh, I can tell you what happened there. Oh, I didn't realize that, you know, that cake or that thing has this much sugar and it in increases this. Oh, all right, I might have a bit less next time. And actually, you don't need to. They recognize that. And actually, a well informed patient, that's all they're looking for. You know, they don't need to be battered around. But actually, it's, you can see the spark once they understand what's happening. And I think that's then you know that that's a really effective consultation. Yeah, no, I think I'd finish just by saying if we reflect on the journey we've been on the last decade, things have changed dramatically. Um, and ultimately, here we are in a position where we have the technologies available to really put the person with diabetes in the centre of this, empower them to self-manage their condition. But I think as we've touched upon, there are going to be a lot of challenges in making the technologies wider, more widely available. I think as healthcare professionals, we need to really think about how we upskill and ensure that the services we provide are ready for it. In terms of services, I think we need to somehow adapt and change how we deliver diabetes care to ensure that we meet the needs of those most in need. And I think all of us have a duty of care to ensure that those from the most deprived backgrounds or minority ethnic backgrounds are not forgotten along the way on the journey that we're going on. Thank you, Emma. And that's a really important um, point, I think, to end on there. Um, so it just takes me uh, the last few minutes to say thank you ever so much to our amazing panel. You've all given some really interesting insights, a lot of food for thought today. 
Um, I also just want to thank uh, our audience, everyone who's watching. I hope you've enjoyed the session today. Um, please do share the link for the event with anyone and everyone. Uh, and don't forget to tweet um, hashtag KF online as well. Uh, so for the audience, uh, just to let you know, there's going to be a feedback button that's going to appear at the bottom of your screen, asking people for any feedback they'd like to share. We'll also send out a survey link in an email shortly. Please do um, fill that in. It helps us um, develop our, our events and improve them, um, hopefully, uh, going forward. Uh, so yes, do fill that in. And finally, just a huge thank you to our sponsor, Abbott, today. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you all again soon.